Well, thank you everyone so much for joining us today. I am Krista Fairbrother and I am a registered yoga teacher in Florida. And I teach both yoga for arthritis and aqua yoga. And having come out of both these trainings, I really enjoy teaching both of them. And there are so many synergies between the two that I have tried to connect Camilla Nair and Dr. Stephanie Munaz, both of whom are joining us today, to try and integrate the programs a little better moving forward so that we can all be helping more people with arthritis in whatever yoga modality is best for them. So Camilla is going to speak first today, and then we're going to hear a bit from Stephanie, and then I will be joining back in again at the end to talk about how you can integrate the programs, whether you're a yoga teacher or a yoga practitioner. So I'm going to turn it over to Camilla now. Hi, Krista, and thanks so much for organizing this and inviting me to, to present. And hi to everyone who's uh, on board right now. I know time is precious, so it's really nice that you've taken time out to, to listen to us and to join in the conversation. So thank you. Um, I've been teaching aqua yoga now for mm, the best part of 20 years, and um, I was commandeered by um, an aquatics uh, wellness professional uh, at a local YMCA actually who was doing an excellent job in serving diverse populations and as many of you know there's a lot of the diverse populations that we want to serve uh, with yoga who are actually practicing non-yoga in the water they're doing aquatics and things like that so uh, she asked me if it was possible to integrate a meaningful practice into the water and I knew it was. I was a little bit reticent, as we usually are being pioneers, aren't we? What's everyone going to think and all the rest of it? And is it valid? Uh, the students validated it from the get-go, actually. And uh, with their encouragement, testimony, enthusiasm, um, I wrote a book called Aqua Kriya Yoga. And then after some years, developed a teacher training program, which now has been bumped up to 40 hours. So with the yoga community kind of splitting off a little bit now and people wanting to support a more therapeutic uh, modality, it's, I think it's going to, to become more and more popular. And think about the amount of swimming pools that there are across the country. It gives a great opportunity for yoga teachers, and there are more and more yoga teachers now, of course, who have an opportunity to, um, to add extra income um, you know, in their lives by teaching privates and whether they're on land or in the water doesn't really matter, but they have the accessibility of hopefully using a swimming pool. So I find that really, really exciting. And uh, I travel around the country and teach, oh, hold on, <laughs> travel around the country and teach uh, through, the year, through the year. And uh, next week I'll be in Houston doing a teacher training. Then I'm off to Santa Fe, uh, Central Florida, um, Chicago and uh, and San Jose and then somewhere in there Singapore as well so busy um, and it's wonderful to to be able to bring this modality to teachers and practitioners because the training is open for everybody at level one but you can flick the uh, the next slide right. please Krista so um, those of us who have kind of been around institutions like YMCA's, Jewish community centers, senior centers, and so forth, know that there is a huge population of um, older adults and people suffering from arthritis and fibromyalgia and so forth who are already exercising in the water um, and would absolutely love. I mean, these are like the, the people that were burning the bras and out protesting, you know, in the 60s and stuff. They're coming of age. The baby boomer population is exploding. And uh, I think it's really vital that we give them the opportunity of finding a mindful practice uh, through Hatha Yoga in the water, somewhere that they find it um, very, very accessible. So I feel that there's this huge population of people that we're not serving. They perhaps even chair yoga may be too painful for them. Um, and so bringing the modality into the water, I think, can, can really, really help. We have this fear, I think, that comes into our constitution as we get older. We go through that vata stage. Those of you who've studied any Ayurveda know that we get a little bit more air in our constitution. Uh, it makes us a little bit feeble and weak, body, mind, and so forth. And it's linked to um, fear is kind of stored in the thigh bones. And one of the things, Christy, you'll probably remember from the teacher training, 
is teaching people how to ground the femur bones, press the thigh bones back, anchor the tailbone down and draw the belly button in and the water is the best place to do it. It's almost like dumb luck. As soon as you get into the water, you start finding that elongation uh, that in yoga we know takes kind of a long time in a gravitational field to develop. Mula Bandha, Udhyana Bandha. And how are you going to teach that to someone who comes to yoga, uh, aqua yoga in pain, um, you know, uh, very late on in their life? It's easy, easier, much easier in the water to, to cultivate and to sustain, even without talking about that kind of stuff. So, um, uh, you know, and as we get older, I think we, we tend to practice changes so much. Um, I used to practice uh, Chakrasana a lot and uh, Scorpion and things like that. It's become, my practice has become smaller on land as, you know, I'm sort of approaching, you know, the second half of my 50s. And so um, I find that I can do, not Scorpion, but I can do Chakrasana in the water quite nicely and really breathe and be really comfortable and stable, which as we know through Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, that's the only prerequisite of asana in any case. So we submerge the joints in water and uh, it helps to increase range of motion. And we can even start to refine all the small motor skills as well in a nice, gentle, soothing environment in the water. The, uh, the water obviously is fluid, you know, linked to uh, one up from the earth uh, chakra, it's the water element, Svadhisthana. And so keep moving, I think, is what we like to, um, to encourage people with arthritis and fibromyalgia to do. It's very easy to become stuck. It's like a pregnant woman. You know, the contractions start, and what does she do? She, if I stop breathing, if I just, you know, hold myself in this position, it's not going to work. It's no, you can't do that. You've got to get down and really get earth-centric and start to breathe and ride the wave, ride the wave, really. So I think uh, people can move very freely in the water, almost instantaneously pain-free is what I tend to find. Um, even from the first class, you know, people are pain-free, which is wonderful. And of course, they move at their own intensity. Uh, we have this viscosity. If we just put our hand in front and kind of waft it through the air, there, it's very difficult to kind of feel anything tangible. When we're trying to educate people uh, as they're old, you know, slightly older maybe and have never done yoga before perhaps into experiencing things and moving in a directional way mindfully, it can be a little bit difficult but the water visco viscosity provides that sort of proprioception and then of course from there on they can vary how they're moving through the water and as teachers, practitioners, we, we kind of know how to judge that and they have an opportunity to use the water like a variable weight machine moving through it. So the water also has a fantastic property, of course, of hydrostatic pressure, that little squeeze that we get, that hug when we come in, and that helps to um, really increase the depth of our exhalation. And obviously, as you know, we get stressed even um, in a gravitational field as life presents itself to us, as we get older perhaps, as our posture changes, as things happen in our life, our breathing changes, and I think it's really hard to, um, to train people to um, dismantle um, erroneous breathing patternings. And yet if you go into the water, just by getting into the water, it starts to, uh, you know, the muscles start to contract a little bit more through the exhalation. And as we know, nature abhors a vacuum. So to the degree that we're exhaling, all we've got to do is inhale. And guess what? The buoyancy helps us do that. So it's a win-win situation in terms of increasing you know respiration so that we're um, decarbonizing the blood and so forth and uh, you know increasing our posture a lot of people still breathing in the upper respiratory system and we can play around in lots of interesting fun ways in the water to try to get people to to breathe deeply you know just you remember it Krista the Kelpasana just moving through the water and focusing on breathing um, I think as we get older and we're all getting older, unfortunately, um, I think really what we try to do, those of us who have been practicing yoga for a long time in particular, am I going to remain lucid and ambulatory for the rest of my life? Because at the portal, uh, when the cord is cut and I move away from this body, am I going to be conscious or am I going to be wailing and screaming and all the rest of it? I want to be able to sustain all of that. 
And so um, whatever happens, and I'm doing a lot of my practice in the water and on land, so I kind of see the benefits for both. But I want to be able to, to really be able to sustain that throughout my life, you know, so that I can transition um, mindfully. So a practice, uh, yoga practice in the water, I think, is really, really uh, accessible, especially for these huge populations of people that are in pain through uh, arthritis and fibromyalgia and other related um, uh, diseases too. And as my param guru always used to say, you know, it needs to be fun. Keep it simple, make it fun. And I think for us yoga teachers who are out there, the biggest part, uh, you probably remember Krista, is trying to, you know, make it accessible. We don't, obviously we're not going to be teaching the deep esoteric stuff that we may be able to have time and presence for on a land class. We keep it simple. We make it fun. We speak to the audience that's in front of us. And if it's about old age and constipation and, you know, creaky old bones and the chin pushing forwards, then we're going to use those metaphors to try to lift them up, inspire them, and bring them into this community that's really been ostracizing them. The yoga community has done a fabulous job in making the populations uh, across the world think that it's about bendy, thin, and young. And it's not. Mm -hmm. Youth is wasted. On the, on the young, I think, a lot of times, because you know, we're looking for wisdom, aren't we? So uh, I think it needs to be a mindful practice so that we can sustain continuity of consciousness. And, you know, being in the water itself is just so healing. When we think about fun, um, you know, we think about probably a holiday, you know, vacation. And very often we're going to be around a medium of water, the sea, a lake, a swimming pool, you know, where we're having fun and just even being in the water and just kind of looking at it, it, I think it really affects the parasympathetic nervous system, allows us to breathe nice and deeply and uh, it makes us feel a lot better in our practice. So we get a lot for our, for our money and I like, I'm a bit of a thrift shopper, so I like to get more bang for my buck wherever I can and I do actually think that we move more prana uh, when we're in the water because of the properties of water. So you can... Uh, Switch it over. And it's not just for old people, um, it's also for, for young people too. I've had a lot of people coming to Aqua Yoga, a lot of young people who had a very strong asana practice who have been injured and they're coming to rehab and then it's like, wow, this has just blown my universe apart. I can't believe how different the pose feels in the water and how much more alive I feel. So it's not just for the old grannies with the flowery hats, you know. Uh, you know, people are starting to do mindful stuff in the water as well. And if you've seen the latest Speedo ads, well, they were out, I think, last year. It's all about cross-training and about the power of athletes, Olympians, and so forth coming into the water to um, to cross-train and seeing the benefits of that. So it's uh, it's not just for old people anymore, you know, because they can't do anything else. No reason why we can't switch our practice up a little bit and bring it into the water to sustain it for forever. And in this slide, you see my dear, uh, one of my dear students, Art. She came to uh, yoga in her 80s, aqua yoga, because that was all she could uh, think that she could do. And uh, after she was, uh, she was the one that uh, bought my book, um, made some copies of some of the poses and stuff, and laminated them. And she would be but with her friend. Uh, in the swimming pool when I came to teach class and she'd already done her own little bit too and uh, you know she um, I told you the teacher training for level one is open to everyone and she said can I come to the teacher training program you know I think I'd like to learn a little bit more I don't want to teach and such and and usually I, I said of course so she she came and I do an intake I do a student intake because I want to find out what people want uh, what they're trying to achieve with you know with their with their you know, certification and so forth. And this is what she said on her student intake. I'm not taking this for certification. I do not wish to teach. I'm getting older and I hope to use it, listen to this, to prepare for death. Now that to me is like, wow, that is exactly where I am in my practice. I teach all the way from, you know, prenatal or pre-prenatal, which to me is before you have a kid, all the way through, you know, green burials, funerals, um, death insights, those kinds of things, breaking the taboo around death. And to me, this was like, wow, this is a wise woman that I want to be like her when I'm 80. You know, use your yoga practice 
um, to prepare for death. Apinivesha klesha, the last klesha that we have, and even our spiritual people, whatever that means, have that uh, propensity to want to sustain continuity of consciousness. But when we talk about death, mm, don't want to talk about that, might bring it on a little bit. But actually, it helps us to enjoy the rest of our life, which is what it's all about. So she was a great blessing. And, you know, I found that I've had quite a few students, people in wheelchairs, uh, people with fibromyalgia, hip replacements, all kinds of things who want to come and do the training and have actually ended up subbing classes and stuff as well you know, at the local YMCA's and have done an excellent job. They've embodied yoga at a very deep level. Uh, so it's like putting you on a fast track to, uh, to yoga and the meaning of yoga. And I, I think, you know, on a personal level that um, I, I don't think you have to fall asleep before you get, you know, before we die. We want to sustain it so that we're lucid and ambulatory, even in our dotage in the 80s and 90s and so forth, in spite of the state of the physical body but if we're in pain if we're suffering it's not possible to relax it ain't possible to meditate either I've tried it and it doesn't work so we have to find a place where we can um, diminish the pain in the body and sustain our practice there are millions of people out there that are in the yoga world already practicing and teaching what are you going to do when accident or degeneration or both starts to you know to, to come into the body Where's your practice going to be? You're going to give it up? And sadly, I come across too many people, my mother being one of them. And she was the one that introduced me to yoga when I was 17. She's given up her practice because of arthritis in the neck. You don't have to. You just submerge yourself vertically and, uh, and then start to build your way progressively to shallower water with your practice and then hopefully translate that to land. And you certainly will because you'll feel the benefits by being in the water. Next slide, Krista, please. <laughs> She's meditating. So I think what we're looking for, and in this picture you see a beautiful student here, um, grace, calmness, and childlike wonder. I think that's what it's all about. We're here to enjoy ourselves, really. And I think in the water, it's our friend. If, we're, if we just strip off the skin of the body, what are we left with? Mostly water. And so we have that morphogenic resonance as soon as we come into water. We have this relationship uh, where we can dismantle the gripping. And yoga, I think, more than anything, is about getting rid of stuff, not getting anything. We don't get anything. We are perfect, complete, and whole. It's just that we function in a gravitational field that is probably not our original um, you know, place of call in any case. The mystics would say that we came from the ocean and to the ocean we will return. And so very often we find that we're much more comfortable in the water than we are on land. But what we learn in the water, what we practice in the water, absolutely will have bearing upon how we function, function and form in the physical realm where there's uh, gravity. So uh, I think we, uh, we like to sort of think about embracing change facing the changes in our life of which there can be many and unless we can be stable unless we can breathe deeply we can't think properly and so we start to become childish you know sometimes i think as as we as we age and our parents age it seems like we're the parent and they're the child i don't think my mother's listening but <laughs> but you know what i mean where we sort of we start to become sound like the parent as we're taking care of our parents and uh you know, I think it's important that we, we learn to stand on our own two feet for as long as we possibly can and advocate for ourselves. And I think that uh, we can certainly do that. So I think really the, you know, the life um, goal is to, to enjoy life to the fullest. Next slide, please. Benefits of practicing. Well, there are tons. I just thought I'd choose a few of them, actually. Uh, I said it before about the, you know, moving the hand through air, not very tangible, can be some risk of um, falling, tripping, and damaging something because you've got momentum um, in a gravitational field. So if you're going to trip um, and fall, then obviously we know lots of people are going to, um, you know, maybe have a hip replacement after that, smash the pelvis, all kinds of things that can happen. They're not using the recovery muscles that are drawing the muscles down the back of the body. It's usually linked to extension in yoga. 
And so we have this proprioception of knowing much more where the body is in space and time. And in yoga, uh, as many of you know, the, um, the uh, back of the body is really a symbol of the unconscious mind. That's why back bends are generally so difficult. And that's why um, as we get older, um, generally, um, back bends become more and more challenging. And if people can't get up and down off the floor, which is very common with our populations, of course, that we're talking about today, where are they going to find their extension poses? And uh, I, that's one of the most beautiful things, I think, in teaching aqua yoga is seeing how many people can do a fantastically organized back bend, cobra, or you know, up facing dog or something like that, or even chakrasana, you know, chakra pose. Uh, finding a pose that's stable and comfortable and where they can sustain the integrity of inner body length is possible in the water, which is absolutely fantastic. So extension poses, I think, are one of the big pieces that people can pull away from an aqua class where on land, you know, we're starting to go back to the fetal position. And we've got to learn how to use those recovery muscles uh, descending down the back of the body. So being in the water um, helps to counter gravity and compression. The water resistance, the viscosity and everything, um, and support, you know, because it's an aid, the buoyancy is an aid as well, and like a teacher's assist, if you like, really, uh, means that we can have a three-dimensional program for our seniors rather than just vertical on land. They might be sitting on a chair or standing up, can't get up and down necessarily from the mat all the time, but in the water, they can lie down, they can go prone, they can also go vertical. So they still have this three-dimensional program um, without having to worry about getting up and down from the mat. And also, of course, they can increase the intensity by using, we have sexy props too in the water. It's not just about blocks and straps and all the rest of it. So there's lots of things that we can use uh, in the water to intensify the practice. And um, the general rule when we um, have joint issues and so forth. Um, it's to submerge the joint that's in pain or inflamed. And so, uh, like in the case of my mother, for example, where she has arthritis in her neck, she would be kind of vertical for a, a, a time until she's pain free and she can enjoy a range of motion there and then start to move more into shallower water. So we increase the amount of buoyancy, decrease the amount of gravity that's affecting the body. Next slide, please. Oops, sorry. <laughs> so yeah, uh, the land, the law of the land is gravity and momentum, which means sort of change. Um, it can be, uh, it can lead to, if it goes unchecked, of course, bad posture, that stereotyped, stooped person's position with the chin pushing forwards, weak and feeble body, weak and feeble mind, re resorting back to the feet. You know, the fetal, it's a fecal, the fetal <laughs> position again, going back to the fetal position again, um, but unconsciously. So um, the water is our best friend. Buoyancy and hydrostatic pressure are just transformative for our practice. So sort of to, to summarize um, this section, I think it's the water aquatic yoga uh, is a place to begin a conscious practice if uh, a person hasn't started practicing yoga at all, great place to start in the water, but don't discount it. It's also uh, helpful, I think, for people who want to continue deepening their personal practice in Hatha Yoga. If you haven't tried it, I suggest you kind of get into the pool and try it, if you, have, if you like water, that is, of course, and, uh, and just see if you can uh, explore different ways, because that's what we should be, explorers. There's nothing more exciting, I don't think, than investigating and being curious about ourselves and what we can do. And, uh, and I think, you know, a lot of my, a lot of my students, I'll say, you know, it's, did you ever read that book to your kids? You know, the little engine that could, I think I can, I think I can, oh, I can. And that's what I hear over and over again, um, in, in the pool when I'm, um, you know, talking to my seniors and those with arthritis and fibromyalgia in particular, I didn't know I could do that, but I can do that. And that is, fantastic upliftment, I think, for us, our self-esteem and, and um, self-awareness. So thank you, Krista, thank for you, that. Thank you, Pamela. Thank you very much. So thank you. So 
Stephanie, can you introduce yourself and take it away? Thanks, Krista. Um, so my background is that I am a yoga researcher and a yoga therapist. Since um, 2003, after becoming a yoga teacher, I joined the Johns Hopkins Arthritis Center and began studying the effects of yoga for people with rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis, as well as other conditions with a team of researchers at Johns Hopkins that ultimately became the topic of my doctoral dissertation in public health. And the, the study that we did got a lot of notoriety and um, ended up being replicated at the National Institutes of Health in underserved populations. Um, and during the time that I was conducting that research, there was such an interest on the part of yoga professionals, yoga teachers and therapists wanting more skills to be able to work safely with people who have arthritis. And uh, on the part of people living with arthritis who thought yoga might be beneficial, it had been mentioned to them, they read a little something about it, but they didn't know where to begin, how to find an appropriate class, the right teacher, the right resources. And so I, in addition to being a yoga therapist and a yoga researcher, I started training yoga professionals to work with this population. Um, the, the potential for yoga's benefits on all levels of life and being are, um, are dramatic for, for people who are living with arthritis. Unfortunately, a lot of teachers don't necessarily have the skills or the understanding to be able to meet a person with arthritis where they are, to help them find a practice that works for them, to help them to feel whole, and to use not just the physical practice of yoga, but all of the practices of yoga in, um, in alignment with wholeness. Uh, and so that has, has picked up a lot of momentum uh, the, the Yoga for Arthritis trainings, level one, um, then mentored practicum, and level two achieving certification are uh, part of several 800-hour training programs for yoga therapists and are also continuing education for, uh, for yoga teachers who just want more exposure to this information. How is it beneficial uh, on a physical level? people with arthritis need to exercise. And other forms of exercise are not necessarily accessible. Um, and yoga can be adapted in myriad of ways, countless ways. And I love hearing about the water practice as yet another way to adapt yoga practice according to unique needs and challenges that happen for a person living with arthritis that um, are not static. So those needs and those abilities change day to day. Uh, so I love thinking about the water as a place to uh, to cross train, to, to have um, diversity in your yoga practice, and also to take your yoga practice when you have an injury or a flare in arthritis. And that's certainly something that we do in the Yoga for Arthritis program. How are we going to you know, meet you where you are and find what's going to work best for you in this very moment? and harness the best of science to use all of the practices in a way that, that changes the way that you live with the disease. So changing uh, pain processing and neuromuscular connections and gray matter in the brain, changing perspective and outlook and uh, cognitive reframing of just what it even means to be living with the condition uh, in alignment with, with yoga philosophy. And as you can see on this slide, we've gotten a lot of press. So uh, we've been fortunate that there's a lot of interest in this topic and, um, and it's been covered a fair amount, which um, just allows us to reach more people with this message, not only that, um, that yoga can be helpful for people with arthritis, but also not all yoga classes are, are the same. Not all yoga professionals are equally equipped to work with this population and that you have to advocate for yourself and find a fit that works for you. You can advance it, Krista. 
the the program, um, you know, oftentimes people think about arthritis as a musculoskeletal condition. There are more than 100 diagnoses within the umbrella of arthritis. So we heard earlier about fibromyalgia as one example, um, and there are many others, and they all operate differently within the body and impact not just the musculoskeletal system, but all of the systems of the body, and therefore also the mind, the emotions, even sense of self and spiritual framing. So fortunately, medicine is moving toward a biopsychosocial model that recognizes that all of these parts are connected and influence each other and need to be considered in care. And even spirituality is sometimes added to that. And yogic philosophy has a parallel framework, which is the Panchamaya Kosha model, wherein we don't just consider the physical body when we're thinking about the effects that arthritis has on a person's life, but all the layers of self, the energy body, the, the mind and emotions and wisdom and spiritual connection, that arthritis impacts all of the layers of self and yoga can have an impact on all of those layers. So a holistically um, affecting condition requires a holistically focused um, treatment or um, or management program and that that's really how yoga is built so we make sure to think about yoga as holistically as it is and also consider arthritis in that way you can advance the slide uh, so we we consider what we call the essence of a pose first of all you know i've already mentioned that we are looking far outside of just the poses because um, those are often considered a way that yoga helps with arthritis, that it's a way to exercise, but it's much more than a way to exercise, of course. And the, the practices of mindfulness, meditation, relaxation, um, chanting, uh, all have, and even the, the lifestyle and, and ethical principles have potential to, to help people live better with arthritis. But the physical practice alone can be modified, there could be a different pose for every, every person practicing. That it's not about making a certain shape, it's about the energy and intention behind a pose, be that a physical intention, you know, we're, we're lengthening the hamstrings, an energetic intention, we're surrendering in this pose. So why are we doing the pose? And then how can we achieve that in a way that's safe and appropriate? And when we're talking about gravitational field, oftentimes that means changing the relationship to gravity. So can we move this into a chair? Can we flip it upside down? Can we take it over to a wall? And even how can we help people to get up and down from the floor safely so that they can do things in life that allow them to be more mobile and more independent um, as we age, including you know getting on the floor to be able to play with grandchildren and, and pet your dog and all of those intangible aspects of quality of life that really make a difference in how someone feels. You can move it forward. I think that's me. All right, and I hand it back okay. over to Krista to talk about the intersection of these two um, wonderful practices. So again, thank you everybody for joining us. If you joined us late, my name is Krista Fairbrother and I am a relatively new yoga teacher. I've been teaching a couple years here in Florida and when I decided to do yoga teacher training, I had a lupus diagnosis and I obviously had some health problems and I wasn't entirely convinced I wanted to teach yoga, like many people who go into teacher training programs. So I started the program and in the middle of the program, I changed rheumatologists and my diagnosis was changed to mixed connective tissue disease. So it turns out I've had arthritis when I first started showing symptoms at about 12. And so I had pretty extensive arthritis everywhere. And it was really a shock because I really couldn't cognitively deal with, well, how could I be in so little pain and do all these crazy yoga moves and, and have arthritis everywhere? It didn't make sense. So when I you know, thought on it and got over the shock, it was like, well, it's of course, because I did yoga all this time. So I give the yoga fully the credit for this. And it, it really made me significantly more serious about wanting to teach yoga. And I've really dedicated myself to that since I got on Google The Power of the Universe and found Stephanie's program and did the training in Yogaville. And while there, I met another yoga teacher here in Florida named Mary Veal, who does 
aqua yoga and I had never even thought of that and it was like wow that just sounds you know really great so in keeping in the spirit of really wanting to teach to people with arthritis I came home and then googled Camilla and went to her program and so I've really ever since I've been a yoga teacher is I work with people with arthritis whether it's on land or in the pool so talking about how I synthesize these things so Aqua yoga, it's very similar to a land-based practice. You warm people up by taking the spine through the six range of motions. You go through, in this case, your series of standing postures, since we don't do a lot of sitting down in the pool, for obvious reasons. I can't convince my students to learn handstand. Not, nobody's taken me up yet. The kids will, but none of the adults will. Um, and you build to your peak pose in safe ways making people, or excuse me, encouraging people to accommodate their bodies. We can't make anyone make it safe, but we try. I sometimes have trouble with that, getting people to, to keep themselves safe. So aqua yoga for arthritic yogis. We, some of the people on this call I know are land yogis and obviously have a lot of reasons to see the benefits of regular yoga. Some of the people have only done aqua yoga and aren't as committed to their land practice. So there's some strengths really specific to the combination of the disciplines for people with arthritis, and there's some distinct weaknesses. So Camilla has gone over a lot of these strengths, frankly. Um, so I won't go over those again. But some of the weaknesses that are distinct to this audience that you wouldn't necessarily think about is it's done a lot in the sun. I know most people in Michigan are laughing at me but saying this. But of course, as I said, I'm a yoga teacher in Florida. So I teach in the sun. That can be an issue for people with some of the autoimmune forms of arthritis. You can get cold, which is why the class times of an aqua yoga class are often shorter. That's an issue for people that have Renault's and, again, autoimmune reactions to the cold. Um, strength. So it doesn't yeah. build strength. Yes. I'm just going to chime in here, um, living yeah. in the north. So yeah. um, a lot of, well, First of all, a lot of her indoors, especially at the YMCA and gyms and that sort of thing. But aside from that, there are often heated pools where um, where therapeutics happen or where uh, where classes, aqua um, aerobics classes happen for for people with arthritis. Some of the arthritis foundation programs. So. Um, maybe not in Florida, but it is possible to find a heated pool. And I do recommend that if you're going to work with arthritis populations, that you look around and see if, the, if you can find a heated pool, which um, not for everybody. There are some people with arthritis who find the heat inflaming. But for a lot of people, um, especially with autoimmune arthritis, the heated water makes a big difference. And there are yes. a lot of pools, actually, even in the YMCA system. There's a lot of arthri you know, arthritis pools in the YMCA system. And many of those, too, are salt water. And if not, then yeah. hot tubs. You can always use hot tubs and do a lot of work, actually, sitting down in a hot tub. Yes. And the person who just chimed in saying that there's lots of heated pools, she gets to work in a lovely salt water pool. So oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Plano, the aquifer in Plano. Yeah, she's doing a fabulous yeah. job. Yeah. Yes. So there is, is great diversity of pools that you can do this in. And, and of course, looking for a pool that works for the audience, whether it's out of the sun, whether it's heated warmer, that's, that's an important concept. So um, strength. Um, why this is an issue, particularly with people with arthritis, is as um, we've been talking, some of the population that does this is older, and they are at risk for joint replacements, whether it's knees, hips, and research has shown, especially with knees, that the stronger you can keep your legs, the less likely you are to need these surgeries. So as a single practice, it does have some limitations. If you, as an arthritic yogi, are combining your aqua yoga with some of the practices that would help you keep your strength, that could be a benefit. Um, as Camilla already spoke to, it can be a little harder to work into the philosophy into an aqua class because you're kind of just standing around milling in the water. You get cold. It feels a little weird. <laughs> We're just all standing in the pool, not swimming. So again, it is it is yoga. It is a mindfulness practice. But you, and again, as Camilla said, speaking to the audience, you may have an audience who doesn't want that quite as much. And they'll tolerate it. And they actually, in the end, will often really appreciate that. But sometimes you kind of have to win people over with maybe an introduction and a taste. 
So yeah, deal with uh, form and function first, and then start to talk about the woo-woo stuff. Because right. then, by then, so, they're going to be hanging on every, uh, you know, everything that they can get from the practice. Right. I'll also and add, that, Krista, having having seen some of your work, that um, that the environment where the pool is sometimes yeah. is a little loud and you know yeah. maybe not as serene. So I think that yeah. that sort of that balance of having the practice in the water that feels really good sensorily and has all of these benefits and then also, you know, being able to practice in an environment that is a little bit more protected, more of a sanctuary type feeling could be nice. And there so, are yeah, lots of yeah, things yeah. like that, actually. Yes. Oh, yeah. Or, there are some. Yes. Or I would encourage everyone to hire their local aqua yoga teacher for privates and then you get your nice, serene, perfect environment. So yes, especially a lot of the YMCA's can be very loud. Um, so you do what you can. If my voice is actually a little strained because I've been teaching all day and uh, it's outside at the pool and loud. Um, oh yeah. <laughs> and then so my land teacher, I teach yoga for arthritis at the Y and aqua yoga at the Y, and we have elephants in the studio above us during our our regular <laughs> land class. So it is really, really loud. So not to say that it's always quiet on land. You have to learn to focus wherever you're practicing. Um, and then the only other weakness I wanted to draw attention to for an arthritic uh, clientele is if you have the autoimmune forms of arthritis, you're at greater risk for heart disease, even when um, adjusted for your exercise level. So if you would be advised by your healthcare providers to really make sure that you are including a cardio practice of some sort in your lifestyle. And if a land-based cardio practice is no longer available to you, then you would want to think about what else can you do in the water to be aerobic, whether it's swimming or perhaps deep water aerobics if you don't, if you want to continue on that um, no impact model, but add some cardio in there. So just something else to think about for some people with arthritis. So um, research. So I work for Stephanie as the program director for Yoga for Arthritis, which is an evidence-based program, as well as I'm actually uh, married to an environmental scientist. So for a yoga person, I have a lot of research in my life. Um, uh, yoga research is very much an emerging field. And unfortunately, there is no aqua yoga research, which Camilla, I'm sure, would absolutely love to see. So if you're on this oh, call yeah, and you are, yeah, if you're maybe a grant writer or you have just some dream to fund aqua yoga research, please get in touch with her. We would love to see it happen. So you can see here that I've titled this, that this is basically research evidence for aqua yoga for people with arthritis that has been transferred from other aquatic exercise models dealing with an arthritic population. So this, this is for people in the water with arthritis, but it's not about yoga. So we're kind of inferring here. And everybody on this call, when they get the replay, you'll also get a PDF of this presentation that has these links to these papers live. So if anyone would like to read these afterwards, you'll get that. So you can see what it um, what exercising in the water does for people with arthritis. So the things that haven't been mentioned, for example, is it can reduce the use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, which is, of course, of benefit to anybody um, who has to take those. And some of the other things just to draw your attention to that haven't come up is I found it really interesting that people have greater participation. So I think some of the limited population finds working in the water slightly more fun than on land, potentially. Mm -hmm. um, some of my clients, I would say that they like the um, less soft conscious atmosphere that they have in the water. They feel, um, you know, they are in their suit, but, you know, the water's kind of up to here. And you look around and everybody's covered in the water up to there. And we're all just doing the best we can. And and again, the slightly lighter environment that can be required in a very kind of loud multi-use area, I think helps some people. And again, perhaps some people who are a little turned off by some of the more serious spiritual aspects that can be in some land classes, because it is in a smaller, more contained slice in an aquatics yoga class, that that can be a benefit as well. Um, the one I found really interesting, the very last thing, so greater reductions in pain than land-based exercise. What I find so interesting about that is I've just started this year where I actually am teaching aqua yoga and yoga for arthritis in the same facility. So I have some clients who can come and see me in both 
modalities. So I am really curious to see what they had to say about the two modalities because, again, as I said, this is not aqua yoga research I'm drawing attention to. We have some research that says land-based yoga reduces pain in people with arthritis. I'm really curious, even anecdotally, to see what these people say about, well, the aqua yoga does this for me for my arthritis compared to the land yoga for my arthritis because me personally as a sample pool of one <laughs> doesn't really uh, doesn't really make for a strong case either way. <laughs> Yeah, no, but we just know that there's huge populations of older adults who are going into the water who might not know that aqua yoga exists, but they're there for aquatics. So they're there for a reason because it's jolly and because they're moving and, um, you know, they're getting the cardio work and everything. So they're already there. It's just that we need, we desperately need to get some scientific research uh, about, you know, aquatic yoga specifically. And Definitely. that would be um, really fabulous. And I'll say yeah. that, that I think that um, aqua yoga actually has the potential to be even more effective than, um, than other forms of activity in the water because it is a mind-body practice, mm -hmm. because it involves breathing right. practices, it's going to engage the parasympathetic nervous system. So we know that yoga, the ways that yoga affects pain are more than just the fact that it's exercise and I'm sure that the changes that we see on land like reduced depressive symptoms and improved self-efficacy and you know things that are not about exercise you would also see in the water so it sure. yeah it certainly would be interesting to see but given that we know yoga helps people with arthritis and we know that Aqua exercise helps people with arthritis. It's a no-brainer to put them together. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I just wanted to address, Rosemary, your question here about water aerobics and the standards of teaching from the pool deck. Camilla can jump in on this, too. I teach both. So I find that my students really like me in the pool sometimes. Um, it can feel a little um, distancing to have that huge ledge. But at the same time, when I do when I do teach in the pool deck, I get um, very good vision on their alignment, and mm -hmm. I can demo what's going on in my own body better. Because obviously, if I'm up to here, I can't I, I have I can't give them a visual reference for what a good hip alignment is, is in a particular posture. So there are benefits to both. I do both. I know Camilla does both. Do you want to I add any of that, Camilla? Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, it's a, it's a great question actually, um, and. Uh, I think the reason that um, starting, at least starting to teach on deck is a good idea and the aquatics professionals are fantastic at communication on deck is that we're talking about poses. We don't necessarily use the Sanskrit words. That would be kind of crazy. Uh, we, we're trying to get our students to understand how to move the body in a specific and mindful way. And it's, it's impossible because, as you know, a couple of feet in front of you, if you're in the water, you can't see anything. And so standing up on deck, you see everything. I, I recommend in the teacher training, as you know, we do the first, the first level is really working along the wall uh, with the teacher above. And of course, you can see fantastically, especially people with scoliosis and things like that. Uh, it's a wonderful position to be in as a teacher to see what's going on. And then, of course, they can move away and still use noodles and pr other props, but you can still see them ultimately. When you start to move into the pool, there brings a sort of intimacy um, to the group. But I, I think you probably have to start off teaching, uh, learning those communication skills on deck first to, to benefit both students and the teacher who can help that see what the students are doing. Uh, and then at some point, I think you feel confident enough, you know your students, they understand the poses that you're trying to pull them into because you want them to understand the poses that you're trying to, you know, to, to get them organized in. And then you can talk about, and I find that when I'm in the pool with them, then I can talk about deeper aspects of yoga. And by this point, they're hungry for more knowledge. You know, the things that we teach them from the deck, for example, if they're doing sort of half baby bug with the shin on the wall, you know, and they're bringing the breath into the back of the body. We're talking about, okay, not that right side, darling, the other right side, because that's ascending colon, descending colon. As you get older, your constitution dries up. So we're, we're giving little snippets of real life stuff, you know, stuff that's important about living our everyday lives. We're teaching them those kinds of skills, I think, uh, when we're looking at them from the deck, from the deck. 
and then there may be opportunities as well where we can get into the pool and it's a different energy exchange it's like you know we're in a, a yoga studio on land which is just really a dry swimming pool if you think about it and uh, <laughs> And then just, and then we can start to get, life, <laughs> I know. and we can start to get even deeper. And, and I find that my students are really hungry now for all of this deep stuff. Um, and so it's just, you know, as, as everything, we evolve as teachers and hopefully our students evolve as well. So yeah, it's a great question, but I certainly recommend teaching from the deck first, especially if you're dealing with people who have never done yoga before, don't know what a warrior one looks like. Uh, you know, it's it's important to be on the deck. Yeah. With our few more minutes, ladies, Camilla, can you go first and talk about your training program for the year and how to contact you for more information? And then Stephanie, do the same. I'll field questions sure. in the chat box while these ladies are doing that, and then we'll take more questions at the end. Okay. So yeah, I've uh, I've got two level program. First level is 18 hours. Uh, it's a weekend training, Saturday and Sunday. Next week I'll be in Houston. Um, then in, whenever it is, can't remember, you have to look at the schedule on the website, www.aquacreatyoga.com. I'll be in Central Florida, Santa Fe, Chicago. Um, can't remember where the hell else I am. But I'm there anyway. <laughs> and there may be another one around New York, New Jersey. I'm not sure. We'll see if that one pans out this year. But um, yeah, just contact me through the website and uh, ask if you have any questions, of course. Level two, that will be in Houston in October, and that builds it up to a 40-hour program, which I'm really, really excited about. And if anyone's going to CITAR this year, um, uh, then I, I have an exhibition table there this year as well. So um, that would be really cool if you're a yoga therapist or you're interested in yoga therapy and you'll be in Newport Beach. I'll be there in June. So look forward to saying hi to you there. Thanks, Krista. Great. Sure. And you know what? I'm actually, Stephanie, I'm sorry, I'm going to interrupt and jump on with you um, because I wanted to talk about how these trainings integrate on one level is we have a reciprocal arrangement with each other's trainings as well. So if any of our Yoga for Arthritis people are on and with what Camilla just reviewed is really exciting to you and you go to one of her trainings, She'll give you a couple of her CDs, audio CDs of her teaching, which are really valuable to help you learn effective cueing. And when you get home and you're like, oh my gosh, what did she say? You pop in the CD, you get to listen to it. And then if any of her people come to our Yoga for Arthritis trainings, which Stephanie's going to cover here in just a second, we give you one of the arthritis-friendly DVDs that she produced for the Arthritis Foundation. So just to make sure we cover that. So I'm sorry, Stephanie, go ahead. Yeah, sure. Um, so if you're a, a yoga professional and um, whether you teach um, in the water or whether you teach on land and you'd like to learn more about arthritis, uh, about how to speak specifically to the, the benefits for people with arthritis, the challenges, how to talk to medical professionals about how yoga, yoga can help people with arthritis, um, we have level one trainings happening between now and the end of the year in um, and Krista can help me with this so yes. at Yogaville in Virginia um, in California San Francisco and Santa Barbara in Boston um, at Kripalu that's coming up that's next coming month. up yes April um, in, in New York. Yeah. okay I think I got them all and then level two will only be in New York this year uh, <clears throat> if you're someone who is living with arthritis and is interested in finding a yoga teacher our website has a list of teachers, and if you can't find one near you, please contact us. Um, and also the Arthritis Grammarly Yoga DVD, if you have been doing a water practice and are interested in trying it out on land with props, then um, you can check that out on our site as well. Krista, is there anything I missed? No, those are all great examples. Camilla, I am typing. Can you talk about your Audible yoga classes? Somebody had that question, and I want to make sure that I cover that for you. Oh, on Audible yoga? Yeah, yeah. sure. Um, there's, um, it's a great site, actually, if you're a yoga teacher. And you know what it's like? Your students are out, you know, you, you students go out of town, and they say, oh, I wish I could take you uh, with me. Well, you can. All you have to do is record a class on your phone and send it into Audible yoga and then start to tell your students about it. You get a little kickback, and it's a very little kickback financially, but, you know, it's uh, something that's kind of helps you build your business, which is wonderful. 
And uh, yeah, I do have uh, quite a lot of downloads on there. I can't remember how many aqua classes I have on there now. Maybe uh, two or three, I think, along with prenatal and meditation and uh, philosophy and such. But um, yeah, it's uh, audibleyoga.com. Great. Uh, two, it was uh, started by two girls in uh, LA. They're not yoga teachers, but they were in the position where they wanted to take their yoga teacher with them wherever they went. And uh, the one only time I've injured myself, in, well, actually, I've probably injured myself a couple of times over the decades I've been practicing, of course. But uh, the last time that I um, did myself a mischief with practicing yoga was when I was watching a video <laughs> and uh, you know I kind of did my back in but uh, this is audible so you just put the headphones on and um, and you can actually uh, wear headphones in the water as well and practice too so um, uh, yeah what was the question again I can't remember what was the question no. oh audible uh, yeah, yoga yes yeah, so yeah. if you you can probably they did used to have uh, if you sign up you know www.audibleyoga.com if you put in my name, uh, it used to be that you got a three-week free trial. So try that and uh, and see if you can get a free trial still. Um, Great, thank I'll you. Also, something that I failed to add, Krista, is that um, that my website is membership-based, and so there is an option when you go to the site. Of course, you could just go to the store and and poke around, or go to the list of teachers and look for somebody near you. Go and look at the trainings. But there's also an option to become a member. Um, there are, are options for community members and professional members where you get a login to the back end of the site and there are a whole bunch of resources there, um, PowerPoints, audio, video, um, research articles, classes, right. So um, that's another option to explore. I am Good not seeing. I did not see any questions in the chat box, so we'll just give it a minute here in case anybody has any last-minute questions specific to the practice. Um, I see lots of requests. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, and Central Florida. It's at Mount Dora. Mount Dora. In August. In uh, or, or, Orlando. Oh. No, that one's in, um, I think it's in August, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, I don't August. know. You'll have to look at the website. It's yeah, Mount Dora Training. It's in August. Yeah, I shared the link recently. So yeah, that would be your next Florida training. It's the nineteenth, twentieth of August. So oh, Houston okay. first, Houston first, and then uh, Santa Fe actually, and then um, can't remember San Jose, um, Central Florida, and Chicago. Great. I see one person typing. And um, while we're waiting for these, again, everyone will get an email uh, later today with the replay of this. So if you're not joining us live, thank you for watching after the fact on the replay. And the, our contact information will, of course, for both of us be in the email. And you'll get the presentation as a PDF. So you can have those research links if you would mm -hmm. like. And I, yeah, I see a question for Claudia. From Claudia, yes, yeah, Santa Fe is fully booked. There's a wait list for that. Um, but yes, Central Florida has openings, and that one is a yummy saltwater pool, actually. So uh, that would be a nice one to get in on. Oh, so Joanne has a great question about yes, hot that's a good tubs. question. Um, mm -hmm. so I'm going to chime in from an arthritis perspective, and then you can maybe speak yeah. to this a little bit more, um, Pamela. So for someone who has an autoimmune form of arthritis, so that would be rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, lupus any of the rheumatologic diseases that are autoimmune, um, you, you want to be really careful about um, infection, about exposure to toxins, about protecting the, uh, the pulmonary system and the cellular system. So being sure that you're not overheating is important. Also for anybody who has high blood pressure, which a lot of folks who have osteoarthritis might have other comorbid conditions like hypertension that you also want to be um, cognizant of. So the, the heat does stimulate um, some of the systems that in yoga we're, we're dampening. So that sort of um, sympathetic engagement can happen in heat, especially if you're in it for a while. So you just want to be aware of that, that if you feel like you're overheating or if you have any 
contraindications or health conditions that could be a risk factor that you're careful about overheating the body in a heated environment. So if you do have a rheumatologic condition, this is an excellent question for your rheumatologist. Is it safe for me to send an extended period of time in a hot tub? And is it okay for me to be doing any sort of exertion or movement in the hot tub? Um, or you are your family doctor if you have osteoarthritis and are managed by a family doctor. And then Camilla, I don't know if there's anything you want to add. Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent points actually. Um, and uh, I remember um, the last largest class, the largest class I've taught in a hot tub was one a couple of years ago at the Sedona Yoga Festival and we had the biggest uh, saltwater hot tub in Sedona looking over the beautiful, um, you know, uh, surroundings, you know, those beautiful majestic um, rocks and uh, that was received very, very well actually. Obviously, it's, if you're standing up, it's a lot shallower, so you get cooler if you need to. So you just kind of vary up, sit down, turn around, do some lunges with the foot on the step. If necessary, sit on the step, take a few breaths, have a little med mini meditation, then get back, back into the hot tub again. If it's a private uh, gig, you know, and they've got their own hot tub, you've got a lot of control over what the temperature is, so you can find your optimum temperature. It doesn't have to be 100 and you know, eight or whatever it is, you know, you can turn it down so that it's a manageable um, temperature. So, um, and a lot of the, you know, the YMCA's and such, they have hot tubs too. So people finish their yoga class, maybe in an 82, 84 degree pool. And then they can have a little warm up and a little relaxation before they go and take a nice shower. It becomes a sadhana, a nice ritual for them. Um, as they're moving, you know, towards their daily clothes and their daily life. So, yeah, absolutely right. There obviously are some, you know, contraindications for being in a hot tub. But uh, if that's all you've got, get the right temperature. If it's your own hot tub, and uh, take your practice into into that. And there could be beautiful um, opportunities. If you're again, if you're a yoga teacher, especially, you're trying to build community, uh, water, full moon, and women. There's no better combination for mindful meditation, mindful gatherings of women uh, and ritual. Well, on that note, Camilla, that is perfect. So thank you, ladies, for joining me thank today. You. So uh, get your drink of water now that we've been talking. <laughs> so, and, and we're right at time. So we really appreciate you all joining us. And please get in touch if you need any more from any of us. Namaste. Thanks to everyone for joining us. Charity.